Well, good morning. Let's say it again. Good morning. I told Teresa I was going to say it in French, and she said, you don't even know French. I said, doubt me again, lady. But good to be here. Good to see everybody with me. I know everyone just sat down, but I need you to stand up, and we're going to greet each other, and we're going to welcome everybody in the name of the Lord. Let's get ready to have an awesome service. Amen. Sunday school. I said, I've been here, got here so early, I, 
I thought I was on a deer stand and I hadn't been deer hunting in a long time because I didn't know we could get together this early. But uh, it's sure good to see what God's doing at Oak Park. Amen. I'm excited about this new chapter. I, I, I'm excited. I love coming to church anyway. Uh, this morning we'll take our knees to the Lord and remember uh, Sister Phyllis Bosarge's sister, Paula. She is uh, uh, having, suffering with pneumonia. The flu's hit my house. My wife is, is uh, in bad shape. Praise the Lord. I got to get her healed. Amen. Is real sick. She usually don't get sick. And Candace is sick, but but uh, just uh, pray for them. And I know there's many households that is represented uh, here today that sickness comes. And I just don't like it when people ain't smiling around the house. Amen. And uh, you build a person so much wood yesterday that I had to go get a load of wood. I, I get home and I felt like I was like little Joe off of Bonanza. I mean, I was just building fire warming up soup and doing all those western type things you know and uh but it, it, was, it was i don't like nothing about those old days amen i like regular heat and and uh no fire chopping the wood chopping and and uh my family well praise the lord but uh if you're here today we're so glad that that you chose oak park and uh this the past thursday night we were out at uh at the mission of hope uh, Brother Anthony is the keynote speaker there now, and he invited me to preach for him, and I enjoyed it, amen. And uh, we had two men just run to the altar. Their names are on the board out there, Claude and Wes is their name, so just call their names out in prayer. We need to cover them in prayer, amen. amen. Uh, we don't stop praying for them once they come to the altar, and uh, just believe God to complete the work in them and uh, get everything straight in their life. Praise the Lord. Anybody have a prayer request that, just, that you just want to be shitting on by the showing of the hand? Let's take those knees to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank and praise you today. I love you. I give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Lord, I pray that every need be met in this place this morning. Lord, it's not by me. It's not by any, any person. Lord, we're just or I'm just uh, the paper boy, Lord. I'm just showing up and, and telling people that, that you are the God that will do the impossible. Lord, you're the healer of cancer. You're the healer of diabetes. Lord, of heart problems and heart, heart ailments, Lord. Lord, cerebral palsy, Lord, you are the healer, the one and only, Lord, and I thank and praise you for that. And Lord, I pray that you show up in, in every individual's need, that, that they show their hand. Lord, they need you, Lord, and we're praying for them and bringing that need to you right now. We thank and praise you today and give you all the glory, honor, and praise for the answer in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap, church. Sit and die. 
Yeah. 
you give the Lord the greatest praise you've given him all day? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. David said, I will rejoice. That means I make a conscious choice that I'm going to rejoice. Does anybody make a choice to rejoice today? Amen. No matter what you're going through, he's worthy. He's still God, and he's still on his throne. Before you're seated this morning for a moment, turn around again to three or four people around you and just say, I'm glad you're in church with me today. Amen. And I certainly am glad to see you this morning. Praise God. What a wonderful looking congregation this morning. If you came to Oak Park this morning, you're saying, man, the crowd's off this morning. No crowd's up this morning. <laughs> it's just when we put it in two services, uh, it was awesome. This morning, our early service, I didn't know what to expect. And the choir got here early, the greeters, ushers, and we had almost 400 people in the early service this morning. So I praise God for that. As a matter of fact, there may be more of them than there are of y'all. I think the early service beat the second service this morning, but it is just such a delight today to enter into this new season at Oak Park Church, and it's making room because I shared with the early service this morning, all of these seats now that you see, we weren't able to have any, many empty seats left, but now we've made room for lost people, and we're going to fill the seats up in the first service. We're going to fill the seats up in the second service. Amen. And then we'll, we'll just go by the Civic Center if we have to. Amen at that point. But I'm thankful that God has graced us to be where we are. And he has blessed us. And I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful you're here this morning. I shared this morning the good news and celebration that December, I realized this last week, that in December of last year, last month, we broke an all-time one Sunday attend or one weekend attendance record. We broke an, an all-time monthly average attendance record and we broke an all-time tithing record all in December last month of this past year. I think God deserves glory and praise for that. You deserve appreciation for that. So thank you for your faithfulness and all that you do. I want to mention a couple of things to you this morning. Uh, I want to make sure that I've got my announcements in front of me. First of all, small groups. We began a brand new small group semester starting today. So tonight and next week and throughout this month, we'll begin a brand new semester. That means the doors are wide open. And we encourage everybody of all ages to uh, get involved in a small group somewhere. If you leave, when you leave today, you'll notice that right outside at Guest Central, uh, you'll be able to, uh, there should be a handout out there that has a list of all the different small groups. You can go online to opcmobile.org, opcmobile.org. And when you go on that website, uh, you can see, go in there to the growth groups, you can see all the different groups. There's a map to that location where they're meeting, what time they meet, when they meet, etc. So that begins today, and we encourage everybody, especially with these two the two-service schedule, to be involved in a small group. As we grow larger, it's important that we grow smaller and we maintain those family relationships uh, and that small group is as much about pastoral care as anything. It helps you build relationship with people that will be there for you. Hospital visitation, they'll be there. They'll, they're going to support you, pray with you, all of those things, as well as the discipleship that comes along with it. So please remember that. It begins today. Be sure and get that information for those of you leaders who are using uh, the, sermon, uh, the sermon handouts. Those are at Guest Central as well, an outline of today's sermon, unless it just completely changes, and it could. So, But that's what it's supposed to be right here. So those are at Guest Central. Also want to mention to you very briefly that Kim and I will be leading a group to the Holy Land. We've had a tremendous response already. It is official. We have signed the contract and ready to take that trip in November, November 26th through December the 6th, I believe, is the date. Yes, November 26th through December 4th. No, November 26th through December 4th. There are a few of these brochures that are out at Guest Central. If we need to print some more off, we can. But if you'd like a brochure, it has the price, the itinerary, all of that information. It is the trip of a lifetime. And for $500, you secure your trip. $500 deposit right now gets you in the group. We're going to limit the group to 50 people. It is filling up quickly. 
Uh, it's not full, but it will fill up. So I encourage you, if you would like to go to the Holy Land, as soon as you're able to make that deposit, then you are locked in to that trip. Also, final announcement, remember that this week is prayer conference. It begins Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. And uh, Brian Cutshaw, Dr. Brian Cutshaw, will be speaking in all services, Tuesday night at 7, and then Wednesday morning, and again, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And I shared with the early service, Brian Cutshaw is... Uh, one of my best friends in this world, been a good friend of mine for over 35 years before I was ever a preacher. Uh, his dad pastored the church that I pastored. He graduated school in Trenton, and we just grew up around each other. And uh, just a very, very special friend, an incredible preacher of the gospel. And you will want to be here for prayer conference Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Oak Park. I know most of you that don't know, some of you that don't know what prayer conference is, it's when all the churches of God, leaders especially, from those churches throughout the state converge at Oak Park Church this week for fellowship and the word and just wonderful church services and we certainly want to fill this place up and we want Oak Park family to be here supporting prayer conference amen so I look forward to seeing you this week Tuesday night Wednesday morning and Wednesday night it's time to give unto the Lord Pastor Ricky handed me something and I had something I was going to share at the offering time but he handed me this and I just wanted to celebrate it. I'm not going to mention the name uh, but it's a handwritten note, and the person that gave it knows who they are. But it was such a blessing to me just now. I just wanted to read it. It just that, because when you hear testimonies like this, I've been right where this person was. It says last Sunday I had four dollars in my purse, and that was all I had until payday. I had paid my tithe two weeks before and felt comfortable doing it. God's Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, "You need to put that four dollars in the offering plate." I told God that four dollars was all I had. He said, put it in the offering plate and watch this. I was obedient. Three days later, he multiplied my $4 64 times. Isn't that awesome what God can do? Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not telling anybody today to give your last $4. Unless God tells you to do that, I am not telling you to do that. If $4 is all you got and you're asking me, I'm saying I'm going to help find, take you an offering. We're going to get you through this week. But if God speaks to you, then be obedient to that. If God says, whatever he says do, do it. Be faithful in your tithes and your offering. Around here at Oak Park in the last few days, this morning, as I walked out, there were about 40 kids that were in our children's church this morning in uh, OPC Kids. And Pastor Shane has been over there all week and his team, and they have reworked that entire children's church room. And uh, all these kids were coming out, and they were saying, it was awesome. Somebody said, well, what was your favorite part? They said, Disney World because they thought they were at Disney World this morning. That's how awesome it is in our kids' church. We're ministering to those kids in a way that they're excited about coming to church. And in the last few days, we've been able to renovate. You don't see a lot of this, but the bathrooms back here in this area, a lot of you have never been back there, but there's a room for the choir where they rehearse bathrooms and, and those type of areas back there. All of that's been redone over the last few weeks. Our children's church has had a complete renovation the office area, we had carpet stains as big as I am uh, that, were, that were in there. And as people would come in and out, you couldn't clean them, you couldn't get rid of them. And so we've begun that part of the office kind of getting to get updated. And we're only just a few days away from this entire building being completely renovated. And we've not had to come to you and ask and beg and plead for anything. It's your faithful giving that's allowed us to do that. So thank you for all of your goodness and, and your faithfulness and your giving. And then what that allows us to do by getting God's house in order, it allows us to continue to do the ministry of the Lord that's outside this building. It's not just about here, but this is God's house. It has to be kept in good operating order. And now we're able to continue to do the things that we need to do. So I'm saying that to say thank you for your faithfulness and all that you do for the Lord. God will bless you when you bless him. You can't outgive the Lord. Can somebody say amen? Father, I thank you today for the privilege we have to give unto you as we give our offerings today, receive them from a cheerful heart. God, we give to you expecting and believing that your word is true, that you'll supply seed to the sower and bread for food, and we ask it and declare it in Jesus' name. Amen.
praise the Lord somebody. They say you can live 40 days without food. They say you can live four days without water. But you can't live one second without hope. Can somebody testify that I never lost my hope? Come on, sing it one more time. Some have been, some of you have been through enough that should have killed you, but you made it through and you're here today to testify. I never lost my joy. I never lost my faith, my hope. I love that part of that song says, still here. <laughs> I just want the devil to know and all his demons to know I'm still here. What should have killed me only made me stronger. And I'm still praising him. Still here, still standing. Come on, somebody ought to shout somebody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet this morning and let's give God one more shout of praise this morning. Give him the biggest praise you've given him all day long today. Lord, have mercy. I feel like praising him this morning. I shared in the early service. I, I got to share it one more time. This past week, I went with my son. Many of you have been praying for me and my son. Thank you, choir. Many of you have been praying for my son uh, who has been diagnosed with a, a uh, birth defect in his heart. His heart valve has to be replaced. 23 years old, complete picture of health otherwise other than this birth defect that is within his heart. It's come to the place where it's the best decision for him to have that replaced, but the the challenge that we've had is we went to the doctors and cardiologists in Chattanooga where he lives and we met with one of the greatest heart surgeons in the country there and he said here's your options many of you have walked through this you can either have a, a human valve or a flesh valve rather or you can have a mechanical valve if you take the flesh valve you don't have to take any blood thinner you'll be fine with that but you'll have to have it replaced about every seven years you'll have to have that same surgery over and over and over again the option with the mechanical valve was it'll last forever, but you have to take Coumadin. And at 23, after you live a long life, it's going to affect your kidneys, your liver. If, you're, if you have that and it's 20, 30 years that you live past that, it's not as big of a deal as it is a 23-year-old. And so we're, that's the decision we had. And this past week, we, we wanted a second opinion, so we went to UAB. And on last Monday, we met with, uh, oh, Lord, I feel like running just telling this. Because we met with a surgeon that we had no idea who he was. We were just referred to him. We didn't know that he's one of the top ten surgeons in the country when it comes to this. He is one of the top five on this particular procedure. And so we met with him, and he gave us kind of the same options. And But he said there's a part of the heart that the other doctor need, said needed repair. He says, no, it's fine. It's going to be okay. That x-ray was wrong. That scan was wrong. But here's what i got to tell you. We went to the doctor this past Monday at UAB. I was there with Austin, sat with the doctor, heard the consultation, decided when we left that we were gonna have, he was going to have the surgery at UAB. We get a call on Tuesday. My God in heaven. We get a call on Tuesday. There's a new valve that has been used in Europe for about five years. It's been tested for about 15 years, and everything that we've studied says that this is the most, this is the most significant breakthrough in heart surgery in the last 35 years and I didn't know anything about it but this doctor that we just happened to be referred to just happens to be one of three surgeons in the country that does this surgery 
and it just so happened that the FDA just approved it last week. And it just so happened that they didn't expect to have one of these valves for almost a year. But it just so happened UAB got one on the Monday after Austin visited their own, or on Tuesday after Austin was there on Monday. So we drove to Birmingham Friday, and it just so happened to be that this surgeon that just happens to do this procedure just happened to have this valve that just happened to come in the week after it was approved. And so Austin will be the first person in the United States of America to ever have this heart surgery done. And it'll last for 30 years and he won't have to have blood thinner. And it's just an amazing miracle. Now what I'm saying all that for is first of all to testify and give glory to the Lord and give the devil a black eye. Secondly is to tell you and remind you what I told you last week. At the beginning of the sermon last week, I said, I don't know if this word is for me or it's for the church. But I know about three weeks ago, I was sitting in a cardiac surgeon's office and I heard him give me those two options. And none of them seemed, neither one seemed good for my son. And I heard the Lord say to me two words, watch this. I'm about to do something that this doctor can't do by himself. Oh. And so last week I heard the Lord tell me when we had this miracle happen in our family in his life I heard the Lord tell me I told you watch this you spoke it and now it's come to pass and I just come today to tell somebody God doesn't love Austin more than he loves you and whatever you're going through this morning God is saying to you when it looks like you're at the end of the rope when it looks like there's no hope looks like there's no answer God says watch this because when I step into your situation everything changes the prognosis changes the diagnosis changes everything changes when God is in the midst of it so I want us to pray and I'm gonna to go to the scripture and do little things things a little in reverse this morning but I'm gonna pray and then I want to go to the scripture and today I'm gonna to continue that series of watch this and I want to talk this morning specifically about the battle before the breakthrough and how God uses that battle to turn it into a watch this moment that brings you to breakthrough. Father, I thank you today for the privilege that we have to be in this house, in this room at such a time as this. I ask you today, Lord, to honor your word. God, this morning in this early service, you spoke to us so clearly. And I ask you right now, God, to do a supernatural thing in this service. Move in this place in a special way and we'll give you the glory and the praise and the honor for all that you do in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> I want you to turn with me if you will this morning to the book of 1 Samuel, the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I want to read a lengthy text today about 20 verses, but I I want to use that as the launching pad of the word that I believe the Lord has given me this morning. We welcome all of those who are watching by internet. I failed to mention the last couple of weeks. Also through your faithful giving, we've been able, if you've noticed, there's a camera over there, there's a camera up there, there's a camera back there. And what that does is, and there's a whole room that we've been able to set up to do better quality production. Everything's HD, multi-camera. And so those who are watching from around the world, literally around the world, people that watch each week, hundreds of people that tune into our live stream and Facebook live, we're able to take the gospel where they are. As a matter of fact, I got to tell this before I get in the word. Last week, my mother called me and told me, she said, she told me about this lady before. She's been watching us. She was in a, a, a nursing home. She watched us online before I ever came to Oak Park, and she was upset when she couldn't pull it up, and so we gave her uh, the information how to pull it up here. I've never met this woman before in my life, but she was able to, she was a Church of Christ lady who dialed in somehow to our program. My mom had met her. She watched our services, and God began to do a work in her life. And she would watch from that nursing home. She passed away about two weeks ago, but her daughter came and she said, I want you to tell your son, thank you, and his church, thank you for putting that, that broadcast out through live stream because she, without fail, every Sunday morning, that was her church every week. She couldn't get out. And that's in Rossville, Georgia, in the Chattanooga area. Isn't that awesome? And so many stories like that where God is able to take, through technology, able to take the gospel beyond these four walls, and we rejoice in that. This morning, I want us to go to 1 Samuel chapter 30. This message, this message this morning won't mean much to those of you that are in this room that haven't gone through hell, 
and been faced by the battles of life. If, if you've not been hounded by hell at some point in your life, then you're probably not going to connect with this. This may not be your sermon this morning. But today, I want to talk to some veterans of war. Not veterans of a natural war, but veterans of spiritual warfare. Anybody ever fought in a battle before? You've got the battle scars to prove it. Now, if you've never had to walk through the battlefields of the Spirit, then, then this morning just sit there and smile, act like this word's for you, and there'll be a greater word for you next week. But to those of you that are listening that understand that a bad day is, mu- is worse than just a bad hair day, then this message is for you. I'm talking to those who have had to walk through some battles and some tests and some trials. God allowed you to be a part of a reigning remnant that gets to be part of this generation. What a privilege we have to live in these last days that we live in. God could have allowed you to have been born, I started to say 48 years ago. I was born 48 years ago. God could have allowed us to have been born at another generation, but he allowed us to be born in this hour, in this time, in this season. I agree with Pastor Ricky and what he said either. I can't remember if it was first service or this service that he said it when he said, I thank God for modern things. I, I leaned over to somebody. I said two words, running water. Anytime Little House on the Prairie gets looking good to you, just remember those two words, running water. Amen. I can live without electricity, but you got to have running water. Come on, somebody say amen. See, God has allowed you to be born in this season at this time for this purpose. Read with me 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 1. This is a story of one of the most incredible battles that the scriptures record. It says in verse 1, now it happened. When David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men went to the city, and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Has anybody ever been there before? where it seems like you had wept until the tears had dried up and there were no tears to shed anymore. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a place that some of us in this room have journeyed through. When you've prayed and you've asked God until you don't know what to pray and you don't know what to say. There's no more. They said they'd wept until there were no more tears to weep. Verse 5, and David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now, David was greatly distressed. David was greatly distressed. Why was he distressed? Well, first of all, two reasons. One, because they had come and possessed, the enemy had come and taken everything. Secondly, because Israel was starting to act like church people. And they wanted to stone him. Watch this. It says, and David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. Now, I mentioned this in the first service today. If you're, if you're a leader, if you're a real leader, one thing that I have tried to learn and that I teach and that I really believe is that if you're a leader, then you take less credit than you deserve and you take more of the blame than you deserve. And David was a leader. And David understood that he had to take the blame, that this was his responsibility. And when he looked at this city that had been ravaged by the enemies, and he stood there, and here are the, 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 the people of the city, the parents, and they're looking over the fact that their children have been taken away. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about, I gave the testimony this morning about my son, Austin, and what he's going through. Listen, I wouldn't want to have to go through that surgery, but if I could take my son's place, you better believe I would jump in that gurney and I would take his place in this surgery because when it's your children how many know that will stir something up in you oh yeah you you see you see a mama somewhere a mama cub and you start messing with that baby and you see you see what happens when somebody's children are being affected and here's David David is mourning now watch this they took it says we just read that they took David's family also so not only is David grieving over the fact that, that all of the people that he's responsible for are being affected and that they're weeping until there's no tears, 
But David is trying to lead these people out of his own pain because his own family has been taken. It's a mess. And so David is in this situation, and it says he's distressed, every man for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Then David said to Abathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue this troop and overtake them? And he answered him, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Somebody say that with me, recover all. And he answered, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David went. You see, that's what separates the saints from the ain'ts. It's those who say, I will pursue and I will recover all. I come this morning to preach this word to somebody and tell some folks there has to be some point. There has to come a place. There has to come some level of, uh, of this battle that you're fighting where you have to shake it off and you have to say, hold on just a minute, devil. I'm not putting up with this one more second or one more day. Greater is he who is within me than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. There has to come this moment, this strategic inflection moment when you review your situation and you say, no, no, no. No, no devil you have no authority no power over my life and you've got to back off Amen. enough is enough because until we get stirred up until we make up our mind that we're not just going to roll over and allow the enemy to defeat us but we're going to stand in the authority of the word then we'll the enemy will continue to come against us so watch this so david went he and 600 men who were with him and came to the brook Besor. Where, who, where those stayed who were left behind, but David pursued he and 400 men. For 200 stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook, but sore then they found an Egyptian in the field. Now watch this. There just happened to be this Egyptian in the field who they brought to David. They gave him bread and he ate. They let him drink water. They gave him a piece of cake, of figs, and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his strength came back to him, for he had eaten no bread or drunk water for three days and three nights. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? And he said, I'm a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick when made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites and the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb. And we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said, hmm, can you take me to them? Those folks who are your master who left you here starving to death and sick, will you take me to them? Because I would like to have a conversation with them. As I would say oftentimes, I need to have prayer meeting with them. We need to have a conversation. We need to have an encounter. And David said, that, can you take me to this troop? He said, swear to me by God that you will neither kill me, the young man said, nor deliver me to the hands of my master, and I'll take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, they were there spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Then David attacked them from the twilight of the day until the evening of the next day, and not a man escaped except 400 young men who rode away on camels and fled. And the Bible says that David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away and David rescued his two wives and nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoil or anything which they had. I want you to read that scripture. Not one thing was kept from them. They recovered everything. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and herds that they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. May God add his blessing to his word. Every tear that you've cried, every sleepless night, every moment of peace that was stolen from you, somebody needs to get a David anointing that says, I shall recover all. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell somebody, I plan to recover it all. 
Oh, yeah, nothing lacking. See, God, God, when God gets ready to bring you out of something, he doesn't just bring you out of something. He brings you into something. And I think we need to understand that, that God doesn't just, doesn't just bring you out of your battle, but he brings you into victory. He doesn't leave, bring you out of something to leave you there. I, I preach a message. I've preached it here before where God, it says in, Jer in uh, uh, Exodus that God came down regarding the children of Israel. He came down to bring them out, to take them up to a good and a large land that flows with milk and honey. God didn't just, it's one thing for him to come down to where we were when we couldn't go to where he was. It's another thing for him to bring us out. But he didn't just come down just to bring us out. He came down to bring us out to take us up to a good and large place that flows with milk and honey. Somebody praise him. So the scripture bears witness to us that when he brings us out, that we shall lack nothing. He says that we can retain, we can get back our strength, our joy, our peace. Some of you have been through some stuff that has stolen things from you. It's taken away the victory that you once had. Have you ever met someone who's been through so much that they don't smile like they used to smile? They don't praise like they used to praise. They, they don't sing like they used to sing. They don't, they, they don't rejoice like they used to rejoice. I've been praying during this time of fasting and preparation at Oak Park. I've been praying, God, I pray you give some people back so much joy, so much peace, so much victory, so much love that everything, not just, not just bringing back the miracle, but God, give them their peace back. Give them their joy back. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Some, as great as this choir was this morning, some of the greatest singers in this church are not in that choir. They're sitting, you're sitting back here on a church chair because you have sat there because of the battles and the frustrations and the struggles you've walked through and you've kind of just acquiesced and given up but God said it's time to watch this to get back up to get back on the battlefield and be what God's called you to be somebody say amen, amen. I believe I believe we're living in some of the most exciting times we've ever lived in say pastor we live in troubling times that's part of what makes it so exciting because where much sin abounds grace does that much more abound that means whenever you see a battle, there's always going to be a victory. You can't have a victory without a battle. You can't have a breakthrough without having to go through a battle. So we're living in some of the most exciting times. We've been set up by the Lord to live and be born in one of the greatest moments before the coming of the Lord. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17 that in the last days that it will come to pass, saith the Lord, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. You say, well, that happened in Acts chapter 2. Certainly it did, but if you read that, especially in the Amplified, it really brings out what, uh, the, what Peter was saying in that passage, in that statement. He was literally, by the original text, he was saying, this is the beginning of that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith the Lord, I will out my spirit up on all flesh. What began in Acts chapter 2 is still happening all over this world. The valve has not been cut off. He is still filling people with his spirit. He is still healing the sick and delivering the bound. He is still sending his spirit all over this world. Joel 2.23 says, Be glad, you children of Zion. He will pour out the former and the latter rain all in the same month. I'm telling you we're living in a good time to be alive because it is right now in this moment that we, see, we sing this song. We sing this song every now and then that talks about the Spirit. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. And the line in that song that I love says, help me become more aware of your presence. I want to tell you, he's in this place. Somebody says, well, I just don't feel him. Let me tell you, sir, let me tell you, ma'am, it is not because the Holy Spirit is not in this place. He blew through an upper room in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and he has been abiding in us ever since. He's in this room even. I feel him right now. He's in this room right now. He's inside of me right now. He's inside of you. We don't even have to press into his presence. We're in his presence. We don't even have to pray down his glory. We are in his glory. What we have to do is pray, pray our flesh into his presence presence that's already here. Somebody help me preach. Woo. 
The Bible says in Joel that he will restore the years that the locusts, the eating locusts, have taken away from us. I've preached that through the years, and it talks about that the locust has eaten the oil, the wine, and the, the oil, the wine, and the corn. And I, don't, I understand the symbology of that, that the corn represents the word, the wine represents the joy, the oil represents the anointing. And I've preached those sermons, and I believe that God will restore those things to the church as well. But I want you to hear what Joel says. Joel says, I will restore to you the years that have been taken away. Not only is, because see, here's the thing. You can lose your car and get another car. You can lose a house and get another house. You can lose a preacher and get another preacher. But if you lose time, they're not making any more of it. When you lose time, when the devil eats away time, that eating locust, chews away those years, those 10 or 20 years you spent messed up on drugs and now you're serving the Lord and you think to yourself, wasted days and wasted nights, if I could just have those years back. Well, good gospel news this morning. God said, I'm going to give you back the years that were stolen from you. That means today is going to be so good it's going to be like five days. And tomorrow he's going to restore and redeem the time. That means he's buying back the time that was wasted yesterday and he's giving it back to you today. He said the things that have been devouring, the locust, I am going to devour them. So how do you get rid of locusts? I begin to look up this locust. And I mean, this is, I understand why God used this. I mean, it was a literal plague, but it's also a picture. It's a symbol in scripture for us to, it's a symbol for us to, that represents something. And the locust, the reason he uses locust is because when I looked up that word locust, I thought this is some more creature because it, it is something that cannot be, it cannot really cannot be destroyed. You can't, you can't put it through the fire. Fire can't stop it. It's an unstoppable plague. Fire will not burn up or kill locust. You cannot drown locust. Isn't that something? So how do you get rid of locust, this thing that's eating and gnawing away? It's a, I want you to get it and imagine a type, something that comes and it just eats away at you. Well, my mind went over to the New Testament in the book of Matthew and John where there was this crazy preacher that comes on the scene. For 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we don't read of anything that happened. For 400 years, it's called the intertestimonial period. The dark ages, if you will, where nothing is recorded. And then all of a sudden, there's this crazy preacher that comes bursting on the scenes. He's got a weird appetite, he's got a weird apparel, and he's got a weird attitude. His name's John the Baptist. And he comes preaching. And there one day, we, the Bible records some of his, his exploits. And the Bible says he's over there by the Jordan River baptizing. John the Baptist. Here he comes. He's baptizing and he's preaching. And he's only got one sermon. That's the only sermon he ever preaches. And it's real short. Repent. Repent and be baptized. Repent, repent, repent. Somebody probably said to him one time, could you not preach another sermon? So he spiced it up and he changed it a little bit in one place. And he says, repent, you brood of vipers. And that's the only message he preaches. And the Bible says he's, got a, he's got, a, got a weird attitude because he'll go right up to the king and he doesn't care to stick his finger right in Herod and Herodias and say, you're full of sin and because of your sin, this nation's wickedness, you must repent. As a matter of fact, made the king's wife so mad, she said, I want his head on a platter because she knew if she could cut the head off, if you cut the head off, you cut the mouth off. Who's going to speak for God? If you cut the head off, you cut the ears off. Who's going to hear for God? If you cut the head off, you cut the eyes off. And without a vision, the people perish. And she understood that. But John the Baptist had that attitude that he just didn't care. He's going to preach what God told him to preach. And he's going to preach Jesus until one day Jesus showed up. He had a weird attitude. He had weird apparel. Because he, his dad was a priest in the temple. He wore the holy ephod. That's what John should have worn. But John chose to wear camel's hair. You ever been around a camel? I don't know what camel's hair smells like, but it's got to smell something like a camel. It's not what I'd want to wear. 
I mean, when I think camel's hair, I used to have a camel's hair coat. It was pretty nice, but not in those days. Weird apparel. But the thing that got my attention is his appetite. He had a weird appetite because he didn't eat the roasted lamb that the priest and his family were supposed to eat, but he chose to eat locust and wild honey. So when I thought about that, I thought to myself, you got this thing that's called locust that eats away, that gnaws away, that you can't stop. It just eats away your joy and your peace and your victory, and it just eats and eats and eats. And I thought to myself, okay, if you can't flood it out and you can't burn it out, how do you stop it? How, what in the world eats the thing that's eating our victory? John the Baptist. Because the Bible says he came out of the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. So what does all that mean? John was a prophet. He spoke the word of God prophetically. That means he spoke as speaking for God. And I'm going to tell you what will stop in this day and hour that we're living in, what will stop this onslaught of the gnawing, eating locust that comes to steal and kill and destroy. The thing that will destroy, the thing that's destroying you is when the church will once again rise up with a prophetic voice and preach the word of God. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. This is not the day for some manby pamby feel good preaching if we're going to stop this plague that can't be stopped if we're going to back the devil off of our families and off of our nation and off of our churches then somebody has to speak up for God and speak with authority and speak with power and declare his word and I believe God will raise up a prophetic voice in the church. I'm not just talking about a yea thus saith the Lord, but I'm talking about pro prophecy is the proclamation of the word of God under the unction of the Holy Ghost. And I believe that once again, men and women will stand under the, under the authority and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and preach the word. That sounds basic. But God help us to once again preach the word. So while there's a great restoration, see, God will raise up a prophetic voice to devour what's cursing a nation and cursing a people. But while there's a great restoration, you've got to understand that there's also a great battle. Let me teach some patterns for just a moment. Your blessing is in your battle. Turn to someone and tell them that. Your blessing is in your battle. You may not want to hear that this morning, but you need to know it, that this battle's not in vain that you're facing. There's blessing in this battle. Oh, I, I said it this morning. It's not in my notes, but I felt it this morning as I was preaching. When I was 18 years old, laying in an emergency room, and I had bled out because of a ruptured bleeding ulcer. And they told me that I would have to have part of my stomach removed. I had to have a blood transfusion to put blood back in my body to even get my heart pumping at the level it was supposed to pump. The devil told me, reminded me, because my dad had the same thing happen when he was 16 years old. Every single one of my aunts and every single one of my male cousins had the same condition I had. The devil said, I'm going to kill your future and your destiny. But I'm going to tell you what God did, as you can well see. I lost at that time, right before Kim and I married. I weighed about what I do now, probably, but I, it was, it was kind of shaped in different places, you know. But I weighed about the same thing I weigh now, and I lost 110 pounds. I couldn't eat anything but baby food and crackers. Lost all of that. I couldn't eat it. Even when I ate that, I couldn't hold it on my stomach. But I can take you to the place in the day in an altar at Fairview Church of God in Ida, Alabama, where God showed up on a Sunday night and healed my body. And I've, I've eaten anything I want to, things I shouldn't eat ever since. Never had heartburn one day since I was 18 years old and 30 years because God healed me. Today I stand before, see that built my faith. It strengthened my faith. That when I was born, God had told, God had spoken a word to my dad that I ran from most of my life, that you're going to have a son. His name's going to be Jonathan David Smith, which means dearly beloved gift of God. I remind Kim of that all the time. <clears throat> God's going to give me a son. I'm going to name him Jonathan David, dearly beloved gift of God, and he's going to preach the gospel. 
My dad didn't have an ultrasound. He didn't know he was having a boy until I was born. When I was born, God had given my dad that word. They did the test on me. I had set, my palate was in such a condition that they said he will never be able to speak clearly. To this day, the doctors and the dentists tell me that I should not be able to speak to be heard. The way my mouth and my palate is formed, I should not be able to speak clearly. But when God said you're going to preach the gospel, he said I'll step in and make you speak when you're not even supposed to be able to speak. When my kids were born and the twins were laying in intensive care and the doctors said there's no hope they're going to make it, the devil was a liar. I stepped in. I said, doctor, you keep handling the medicine. I'll keep handling the hope. And we'll just keep praying that God's going to bring a miracle. You know what I had to do? That's the battle before the breakthrough. Sometimes the test comes to your life. So you got to push. When it comes to you, you can either acquiesce and give in and surrender and lay down or you can, you can decide. Are you going to... Are you going going to bow down or are you going to bow up? Are you going to say, no devil, I'm not tolerating this. But through the years, I've learned, that's just a few times, that I've learned that when the devil comes against me, I've got power to push back. And I've learned something through the years. That resistance builds strength. And the more you resist the devil, the stronger you become in the spirit to fight back. So this battle you're going through, it's not made to make you to defeat you, but it come to make you stronger. Just keep pushing back against the resistance because every time you push you're great gaining strength to overcome my lord in heaven see the reason that, the, that david was so successful at ziklag was not only because he just stepped into that moment of victory it's because way before he was ever king way before he ever faced this battle over ziklag David is on the back side of the desert with nothing but a shepherd's staff and a harp. And he's writing love songs to the Lord and he's praising God. And in the midst of his praise, God sends him battles. He had to fight a bear. He had to fight a lion. And then one day he's up against Goliath, that old uncircumcised Philistine. And the Bible says that David's there. And here's what separa separates the saints from the ain'ts. It's when David stands up against Goliath. He takes off all of that armor that he had not tried. And with nothing but a sling and five stones in his shepherd's pouch, he stands up against this giant. And all day long, Goliath, if you read the scripture, it says, and the Philistines said, next verse, and the Philistines said, and the Philistines said, and all day long, Goliath is over there smack talking. Y'all know what smack talking is. And all Goliath is saying, look at you come to me with sticks and stone. Look at you over there, little boy. You sent a boy to do a man's job? Look at this army. And it said just over and over, read it sometime. It says, and the Philistine said, the Philistine said, the Philistine said. And about 20 verses into that chapter, all of a sudden things start changing when the, when the discourse changes. And all of a sudden it says, and David said. Woo, business is picking up now. Because David had had about all he could take, and all of a sudden after the Philistine had said all that he wanted to say, David spoke up, and he says, if I can paraphrase, he says, look here, Goliath. He says, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And you come to me with a spear and a sword, but here's what changes things in my odds. I come to you in the name of the Lord, God of Israel. And he said, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And I believe he began to sling that. And he said, There's, he, Goliath probably thought to himself, well, I never thought of that. He said, well, it's about to enter your mind right now. And he let go of that stone. That stone was released. And Goliath fell onto the ground. I'm telling you, sometimes you just got to say, you got to stop talking to the sometimes. You have got to stop talking to the Lord about your problems. And you have to start talking to your problems about your Lord. Sometimes you got to say, cancer, let me tell you who my Jesus is. Depression, let me talk to you about God. Oh, yeah. Addiction, let me remind you who Jesus is in my life. Somebody give him praise this morning. Oh, i got to finish. 2 Timothy 3.1 makes it clear 
that we're going to have some battles before the breakthrough. Let me try to finish this. For it says in the last days, perilous times, dangerous times will come. See if this reads familiar to you. For men will be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's homosexuality. Truce breakers, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness means you got a steeple like a church, you got a choir like a church, preacher like a church, but you deny the power that is within this thing. The bottom line is that if we're going to fight and conquer the battles that bring us to the breakthrough, then we as a church have got to stop trying to look cute and be the church God called us to be that cast out devils, lays hands on the sick, speaks in the heavenly language that God has given us, and takes authority over the enemy that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Because we're going to face the battles before the breakthroughs come, always. I think about David, how he had been through all these battles before he ever faced this battle at Ziklag. I think about Jesus at Gethsemane. Came to my mind this morning that Jesus fought the greatest battle at Gethsemane because before he ever got to Calvary, he had to conquer his own will at Gethsemane. When he said, Father, let this cup pass from me. If it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, at your will, I'll fulfill my destiny, my purpose. See, God is raising up believers with breakthrough anointing. Cultural Christianity will be, the, the death of cultural Christianity will be the seed of revival in our nation. A corrupt government didn't stop the early church from flourishing. As a matter of fact, it was actually the fuel that fueled the first century kingdom expansion. And listen, God's not looking for a passive church that says, go ahead and take my money. Go ahead and take my marriage. Go ahead and take my children. Go ahead and take my church. Go ahead and take my peace. Just go ahead and take it. No, God's looking for a church that will once again stand up on the word of God, live a holy, righteous life so that we have the integrity to preach the word. The reason we don't preach the word oftentimes is because we don't live the word and we feel there's some kind of, there's some kind of tension that we feel like if we don't live it, then we don't preach it. But I'm telling you, somebody said, well, we better live what we preach. No, you better preach what you're already living. You better live it before you preach it. Because when you're living it and you're living in holiness and you're living in righteousness and you're walking in the grace of God, then you can stand and teach and preach and sing in the authority so that when you tell people to live righteous, you know the grace of God that lives in your own life and you can walk in that integrity. Somebody help me. We have to live Live right and be right once again so we can preach the word with authority. Amen. You gotta understand. Somebody says, Well, I'm just waiting. I'm just I'm just I'm just waiting on my I'm waiting on my my somebody to give me a break. Well, give yourself a break. Well, I'm waiting on somebody to open the door. Build your own door. Kick that door in and do what God's called you to be. you got to understand that when there's a deliverer, there's also an adversary. Moses had a Pharaoh. Jesus had a Judas. And I love this message right here because if Jesus had not had Judas, he would have not fulfilled his earthly destiny, which was go to the cross. You see, the Bible says, Jesus said, I've chosen 12 of you and one of you is a devil. He himself knew that one would betray him and he knew who it was. But yet he was there and the adversary that came against him helped lead him to his purpose and his destiny. If Judas had not sold him out for a few pieces of silver, he wouldn't have been arrested and taken to the cross. Understand that in your life sometimes your friends create rewards for you. I know none of us want to walk through what I'm preaching right now, but there's times in your life where the adversary comes to make you stronger for what God knows is coming down the road. And if you can get through this test today, God's going to take you through the next test tomorrow. When God showed up in Kim's life, when God, when the devil said that she would never walk again, that she would be bound to a wheelchair, I'm telling you, I remember 
rebuking devils and praying and listening to scripture and watching her go through month after month after month of agony and pain with no answers, no solutions. But God said, watch this. I'm going to step in and do something that nobody else can do. That's why that I sat in that doctor's office this last week and I said to myself, God, I know you've been faithful. And if you did it before, I know that you can do it again. And guess what? He showed up one more time because God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody praise him one more time. Every time in history that the church has experienced a great awakening, it's come on the heels of great wickedness. Every time. I'm going to share this, and I'm done. I didn't share this in the first service. In 1947, before I was ever born, Peter Marshall was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. And he said these words, and I quote, The choice before us is plain. Christ or chaos? Conviction or compromise? Discipline or disintegration? And as we look at our country right now, I think we could agree that we're going downhill in moral decline. The things that should be called good or called evil, the things that should be called evil are being called good. Our primary problem in this nation, in this world, is spiritual. And the only solution for turning our nation around is not electing somebody with an R or somebody with a D beside their name. It is when my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. And I think America has two options in front of us right now. It's judgment or revival. I think you know me well enough by now to know I didn't come to preach you a sermon today. I'm coming with a word that I believe is straight from God. I believe it's a word that I speak with authority. We may not be hucking and bucking and running and dancing. But I know what I'm speaking to you right now is on the authority of God's word. And it's in the authority of what he's told me to say in the spirit. If we don't have revival, then we are in big trouble in the United States of America. Because we are in this bubble. I'm not saying we're the only ones. But I'm saying our experience at at Oak Park is unique in that we still believe in the moving of the Holy Spirit. And there are thousands and hundreds of thousands who still do. But I am bold enough to say this, that we are in the minority. We're not the only ones by far. We're not alone. But we are not in the trend of the day. We're not in the trend of the day to have altar services and to lay hands on people that are sick and to, and to pray in the Holy Ghost. We are not in the minority in this culture that we live in. But I'm telling you this, America must have a revival of the things of the Spirit because judgment is coming to America one day just as judgment is coming to all the world. It is inevitable. And my prayer is that before the judgment does come that we will have at least one more, not just a revival, not just a series of meetings, but God let this nation that's a sleeping giant, let it wake up one more last time before the coming of the Lord and let's have a move that sweeps this nation in this world. Let me do this real quickly, Tim, as you come, please. The United States has had a number of revivals, or what we would call great awakenings, that have turned our nation around. The first was during the 1700s. Such men as Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield took part. That's the one that's most familiar to us. During those two years of revival from 1740 to 1742, in two years between 25 and 50,000 people came to believe in Jesus, and that was out of a population of only 30,000. The Second Great Awakening took place in 1790s to 1840s. Preachers like Charles Finney were proclaiming the gospel at a time when when the law was in disregard. Sexual sin was running rampant. People would come from everywhere to camp meetings where makeshift structures, brush harbor, sawdust floors were set up in the middle of a forest. Itinerant preachers would come on horseback from place to place preaching the gospel. One lanky young lawyer who was dramatically impacted at one of those sawdust camp meeting revivals was a young man by the name of Abraham Lincoln who became our 16th president. The third great awakening happened from 1857 to 
1809. It had unique beginnings. A 48-year-old businessman named Jeremiah Lamphere began a prayer meeting on Fulton Street in New York City. At first, there weren't a lot of people that attended that prayer meeting. It started slow. It began to build. Then the stock market crashed. Soon, hundreds of New Yorkers began to gather for prayer. It's amazing what tragedy will do to you, isn't it? And then within six months, 10,000 people were gathering in New York City every day for prayer. Throughout New York City, it was reported that 50,000 New Yorkers came to faith in the months from March until May that year. And one million people came to Christ out of that one revival. Come on, somebody help me. There was, there was perhaps a fourth great awakening I think the Jesus movement of the 1960s and 1970s was a genuine revival in the United States of America. It turned around thousands of young people. Many of those came to faith during the Jesus movements. Our grandparents now that happened during that. I was born somewhere during all that time. We need another great awakening. And it may not look like the Jesus movement. It may look like something else. I remember when the charismatic renewal came, hearing those stories because we are the we come out of a Pentecostal holiness movement and we, we had preached, you know, if you want the Holy Ghost and you can't wear that and you can't look like that and don't put that on your face and don't do this and don't do that. But all of a sudden there was a revival that swept the land through that Jesus movement and you had Episcopal and Catholics and Presbyterians and Baptists getting filled with the Holy Ghost. You had, I remember hearing the stories of a dear mentor of mine, Dr. Paul Walker, who pastored Mount Perrin Church of God, a church of about 600 people. Paul Walker, their campus was on Georgia Tech's campus. They would walk over, he'd go to Georgia Tech at the criticism of every Church of God pastor in the nation. And he would go to Georgia Tech and he would sit in those sit-ins with all of those Georgia Tech students and he would invite them to church. And today there are over 22,000 members of the Mount Perrin Church of God, most of whom 30 years ago were here. Y'all looking at me funny. I'm telling you, there's some people in this city that if you looked at them, you'd think, my Lord, what in the world are they? There's some people in this city you'd say you wouldn't sit by them. If you, par if you walked down the parking lot, you'd make sure not to park close to where they were. But I'm telling you, when the great awakening comes, that's the very ones God's going to use to raise up and make leaders in the church. Make evangelists, make pastors, make missionaries. I'm telling you, but what does revival mean exactly? The Bible says Habakkuk understood when he prayed. I, he said, I have heard all about you, Lord. Habakkuk 3.2. Lord, I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did years gone. And in your anger, remember your mercy. The psalmist prayed in Psalm 85.6. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Listen. Revival is kind of a church word. The secular culture doesn't understand that re the word revival, and they don't need revival. They need evangelism. And here it is, an interesting thing. Evangelism doesn't necessarily produce revival, but revival produces evangelism. Revival is when God comes down to a dead, dying church, and he starts pumping breath into us and breathing into us and all of a sudden the things that are dying the things that are dead all of a sudden he says rise up church and the church has been sleeping the church has been lethargic I believe when God revives the church then he will save the world but it starts in here with his people amen stand to your feet give God praise this morning hallelujah I'm telling you this morning, I believe that God has shaken some people in these last days. I don't mind telling you. I don't mind telling you that I am, I am sick and tired of church as usual. I don't want any more of it. I don't want to sing songs just to be singing songs. I don't want to preach sermons just to be preaching sermons. Everything tells me, Pastor, don't do it that way. If you're going to grow the church, if people are going to come and you're going to fill the seats, then don't do it that way. But there's a greater voice inside of me that says preach the word. Preach it with authority. Preach it with the anointing. Say what I tell you to say. Tr cut, cut, afflict the comfortable and write us. 
that we must have revival in these last days. As they begin to sing something this morning, I'm looking for some people. I'm just looking for some people this morning that will come and join me in this altar. And all I'm asking you to do is to step symbolically, step out of your seat and don't make your way out that door because that says something else. But for the next five minutes or so, I want you just to step into this altar and say, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. We're gonna preach what God tells me to say. I'm gonna walk in the anointing. I'm gonna be who God calls me to be. I'm gonna do what God calls me to do. I'm gonna walk into my breakthrough. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Praise Him. Come on, sing it, church. Say, I feel like praising, praising Him. Yes, I do, and I feel like praising, praising Him. I'm going to praise Him all day long. And I feel. I'm going to pray right now, and here's how I prayed in the first service. It's how I feel impressed to pray right now. I believe that the fact that you stepped out of your seat and you made progress, you are saying to the Lord, not to this preacher, but you're saying to the Lord, God, it's a new season in my life. It's a new moment. I'm stepping in to this new thing that you're doing in my life. And I believe that there's a shifting that's taking place. I believe even among millennial generation and those who are coming after the millennial generation, which is now our teenagers, I believe there's a hunger that's happening. And God help us, my generation, the generation before me, help us to demonstrate the authentic move of the Spirit. No gimmicks, no, no fluff, no, no stuff, no religion. I'm saying, God, let your true Spirit and power fill this place. I pray this week at prayer conference when God's people gather from all over the state. I pray that there's a revival that will begin right here in this house that will spread all over this state of Alabama and radically revolutionize every church in this state. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray for your family. I want you to get somebody besides your husband, wife, someone beside you and just make a point of contact. And I want us to agree together as two or three touching any one thing and I want you just to call out to God for a spirit of evangelism and a spirit of revival I pray that God will take you from the battle to the breakthrough and allow you to be who he's called you to be I want us to say sing it to pray one for another come on pray church pray church in him oh yes and I feel like praising pray why don't somebody just do that come on can you just give God a wave off I feel like praising well I'm gonna praise him praise him in the morning I'm gonna praise him oh yes Like 
praising, praising Him. Yes, I do. Lord, I feel like praising, praising Him. Well, I'm going to praise Him in the morning. I'm going to praise Him all day long. pray one more prayer before I dismiss you this morning. I said there's a difference between revival and evangelism. Well, I believe God is breathing, breathing into us right now. The breath of God is inside of us. He's resuscitating us. How many feel a revival in your spirit right now? You feel a revival, a stirring in your spirit. Now we got to go out and evangelize the lost. There are people dying and on their way to hell. They're everywhere. You say, well, where are they, Pass Everywhere. When you go today on your way home, you'll see them driving down the road. You'll see them shopping at Walmart. You'll see them eating in the restaurant. They're everywhere. God is going to make a way for you to share the good news with them somehow, some way. And I pray, I've been praying this, God give me the opportunities just to love somebody. I have never asked one person in all of my life if I could pray with them who said no. And I've asked that question of some really mean people. But I've never had anybody ever say, no, I don't want you to pray for me. I'm telling you, if we will seek the opportunities, God's going to give them to us. And if each one could reach one, can you imagine what 2018 would look like at Oak Park if everybody in this house would just win one person to Jesus? Could you imagine what the kingdom of God's going to look like? I'm telling you, if you're in this room this morning and you don't know Jesus, before we get done with this prayer, you can know him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth confession is made, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. You can pray from your heart, confess your sins, ask God to come in, and then turn away from those sins, and God has saved you, and you're as saved as this preacher is. You don't have to leave today bound by sin. And so we're going to pray right now. And I'm going to pray for revival. And if you're away from God, I want you to call out to God in your own way and say, God, come into my heart. Restore me. Fill me. Use me. Come on, all over this building. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl under the sound of my voice. You know where we're at. You know what we have need of. And you know how to get it to us. And so, Father, I pray for revival to sweep our homes, sweep through our marriages, sweep through our families. God, revive us once again until we are filled till overflowing. And God, let us evangelize this city, this county, this region for your glory. And God, we declare it for everyone under the sound of my voice. Lord, today that doesn't know you, we call out to you on their behalf as they call out to you and we say, God, save us from our sins. Make us whole. Redeem us. And we will live for you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Can we one more time just give the Lord a I want to I spill my water. Just before we leave and I just miss you, can we have one more prayer? Amanda Tillman's mother was rushed to the hospital during the first service. It's an emergency situation. She's in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and they need a miracle right now. And so let's just pray together as we dismiss this morning. I don't want to leave without having special prayer for them. Would you just stretch us a hand toward heaven as we pray for her? Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray right now for Amanda's mother there in that hospital in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. God, that even right now that you'll stop that bleeding, that you'll bring her and make her completely whole, that you'll restore her for your glory, for your honor, that the testimony will go forth of your miracle working power. We ask it and declare it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. No service tonight. We'll see you Tuesday at prayer conference, 7 o'clock.